probably one of my favorite movies is Star Wars. Star, I like Star Wars. Now, some of you weren't even alive when Star Wars came out, okay? But I was. And I think Nate was like six or seven, my son Nate. I think he was six or seven, something like that, when Star Wars came out. And uh, we, you know, we, we love the whole thing. Now, there's, the theology is not exactly right. How many, how many understand that, right? The theology is not exactly right, but at least it's a movie that has like bad guys and good guys. And you can tell which ones are which. How many know that's a good thing? Because some contemporary things you can't tell. You know, it's hard to see, you know, what's going to happen. So, anyhow, uh, we, always, we always enjoyed watching all, and then the subsequent movies. The only thing that was kind of puzzling at the time was why the fourth episode was the first one they made. You know, George Lucas made the fourth episode first. So the story starts in the middle of something. And then, of course, they've ultimately fleshed all that out. And it's been very, very interesting to see. And I love the music. John Williams' music is brilliant, you know. And, but, there's a, but there's an interesting storyline there for many of you know this, the movie. And, um, and there's a particular place where the Empire... Bum, bum, ba, bum, 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 bum. You know that, right? The Empire? That's the bad guys. That's Darth Vader and all those guys. They're chasing the heroes, okay? Like, uh, they're chasing, and there's a particular place where Han Solo and Chewbacca, who is a Wookiee, yes. I feel like we ought to stop and wait for the interpretation. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Wookiees and Chewbacca's, and it's good. And Princess Leia, again, a heroine, and two really cool characters, R2-D2 and C-3PO. Now, R2-D2 and C-3PO are two robots. One is this little short, round-headed, dome-headed guy who you can't understand how he can do things, but somehow he manages because he seems a little awkward, but he gets there. And then there's another gold computer, not computer, but robot, who uh, speaks with a a really elegant English accent, actually. It's kind of interesting. And that's that's C-3PO, okay? So those are the two robots, and they're in... The Millennium Falcon. What's the Millennium Falcon? Well, that's a really cool uh, spaceship. And the spaceship, of course, is an old one. And it has a few little wrinkles. And they have to kick it once in a while to get it started. But it's the fastest ship in the galaxy. At least that's what Han Solo says, who's the guy who owns it. Okay? And so they are running from the Empire. And they got these things called TIE Fighters that are chasing them. And they're not able to outrun the TIE Fighters. The TIE Fighters are too fast. They're too agile. They can move quickly. They're small ships, and they're trying to escape. And this moment is so pivotal, and it's so exciting to watch it. And as they come along, and they know they're in trouble. They know they're, they're vulnerable. Han Solo gets the bright idea to take the Millennium Falcon with all those on board into an asteroid field. Now, for those of you who are familiar with asteroid fields... That's not very smart. But he decides to do it anyhow because he needs a way of escape. And so C-3PO, having a computer for a brain, says something very interesting right in the middle of this chase. He says this, and I quote, The odds of successfully navigating an asteroid field are 3,720 to 1. And so I want you guys to watch just a quick snippet of what happens and what Han Solo says to that. Let's do it. Make sure we get level. You're not actually going into an asteroid field. They'd be crazy to follow us, wouldn't they? You didn't have to do this to impress me. Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. And there they go. Did you notice what Han Solo said? We're going to escape in the asteroid field. He said, well, you, this is, the odds are against you. He said, never tell me the odds. And that is a profound statement. He is going in there with a positive attitude, a total commitment. And he said, don't even give me the negative side of this thing. And he, in the end, wins out. I love that. And I've called the sermon tonight, Never Tell Me the Odds. And it was inspired by that scene in Star Wars. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to say this. I'm going to make a a quick segue. And that is that, you know what, in life, 
you're going to have a lot of times and often you're going to see the odds stacked against you. It's just the way of the world. If somebody telling you you're never going to have that counter move, movement or something pushing against you, they're lying to you. And so we've got to deal with the concept that we're going to walk sometimes into situations, we're going to go into situations where the odds are stacked against us. I've been in a few of those in my life. How about you? I've had some moments where the odds were against me. And you know, I was interesting, this, this, this thought came to me in an interesting way. I was on the treadmill at the house. Now, I like to get outside and walk in the neighborhood. But guess what? It's been 95, 96, 93, 92. So I kiss my treadmill. I, I love my treadmill when it gets above 90. Is anybody here? And so I was on my treadmill. Now, my treadmill, we got a treadmill. Lisa and I have one. And it's, it's in front of a window uh, in the office, you know, and I'm on there. And the window, I open the window up so I can see everything outside. We got some trees, and it's quite a nice sit setting there where we live. And we've got these two red birds that come every day. I see them flitting around all over the place. We got one blue bird. We get woodpeckers, the red-headed, big, great big ones, you know, hitting that tree. And I love to watch the wildlife. Squirrels all over the place, lizards every once in a while. I mean, it's quite interesting. We have some, some, some deer that show up, you know. And one night I pulled in our driveway and there was a hog about the size of my hood running away from me as I came around the corner, running for the woods to beat the band. I mean, we have a lot of wildlife, even though we're not, we're really in a suburban setting. Okay, but I love watching the wildlife. And so I'm, I'm on there and I'm, I'm enjoying myself. And I, there's one particular bird that's always there. He sits on our car, which is parked usually in the front, or he sits up in the tree. And that's a hawk. He's a beautiful, dignified, large bird. And this hawk is always hunting. And so as he's hunting, you know, I like to watch him. He comes here very patiently. He'll watch. Then he'll swoop down. And he'll grab his prey. And he'll go have lunch or dinner or breakfast, wherever the case may be, depending on when I'm walking. And so as I was watching, I saw this interesting thing. The hawk came flying from the right side of the window across. I saw the hawk coming. And here comes a bird, probably a 20th the size of the hawk. And the bird, this wee little bird, is chasing that great big hawk. And the, and the hawk is trying to get away and maneuver. But the bird's too quick. The bird's too determined. If you looked at it in the natural, you'd have to say in the face of it that the, that, that the bird, the big bird, had all the advantage. That the little bird had all the odds stacked against it. And you know, I've seen that in nature many times. Has anybody besides me seen that? Where the little bird's the one who chases the big bird. Has anybody, how many have seen that? That's a common in, in nature. And for some reason, I've never seen it the other way around. The big bird chasing the little bird. But you'd look at it and you'd say, this big bird has all the advantage. The little bird, not so much. And so you know what? It made me think. It made me start to think about the fact that sometimes when we walk through life, we can recognize, and I think we probably all can identify with the idea, that we've all had the odds stacked against us in various ways. Sometimes the problem is a lot bigger than we are. Sometimes the issue is a lot more huge than we know what to do with. Sometimes the wall or the, or the, or, or the mountain is just seems impossible to deal with. We seem so small sometimes. I remember years ago we used to sing a little song. It said this, little is much when God is in it. Little is much when God is in it. And there's something about this proportionality that started speaking to me. It animated my thinking. Sometimes we're outnumbered. Sometimes we're outgunned like the Millennium Falcon. Sometimes we got, we're outbudgeted. Sometimes we're outclassed. And what do I mean by that? I'm not talking about sophistication. I'm talking about boxing, right? Sometimes when you go in the ring, there's different classes, right? How many knew there were featherweights, lightweights, medium weights, heavyweights? Come on. And, and those are classes of boxers. And I don't know about you, but sometimes the devil will show up and look like a heavyweight, and I feel like a featherweight. There's sometimes I get into the situation I'm in, and I feel like a puny little guy that's going to get beat up. And I have to encourage myself in the Lord. And I have to remember that the odds may be stacked against me, but there's always an answer, and that the little bird ultimately does chase the big bird because God designed it that way. 
And let's not get intimidated by our surroundings. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? So what I want to do, I want to talk about what do we do when we get in that position where the odds are against us. And in the natural, we look at it and we think, man, what are we going to do? I mean, really, what are we going to do? And I'm going to go right to the heart of it, right up front, and then I'm going to unpack it just a little bit here, if you'll follow along. But I want to go to a verse that's a key for all of us tonight to think about. I don't know what your circumstance is. I don't know what your circumstance, I don't know what situation you're in right now. I don't know what situations you've been in. I don't know where you're headed. But I really believe this is one of the pivotal verses, if you want to tuck it away in your heart, that will help you in your life. Because it's a promise from God. It's a proclamation, a declaration of truth. It's a declaration of truth. And it talks about the fact that sometimes the little bird's going to chase the big bird. And so it's Romans 8.31, the last part of the verse. And it says this. It's on the screen. If God is for us, who can be against us? If you're in a tough situation right now, can I encourage you to embrace that truth? Can I encourage you right now to just say, you know what, I'm, I'm choosing to believe God's word. I love what the prophets said back in the Old Testament. Whose report will you believe? Are you going to stand there outclassed by the devil and think you can't make it and think you're going to get beat up, you're going to get KO'd? Do you feel like you ought to just stand there and confess and acknowledge your weaknesses and forget all about the fact that you have an elder brother who's got a gold belt and he's got the title and he knows how to step into your defense? So we've got to remind ourselves that if God is for us, who can be against us? I want everybody to say that with me. If God is for us, and I want you to help me out on this. Let's say the doctor comes in, and he says, your chances aren't good. What are you going to say? If God be for us, who can be against us? Absolutely. What if the banker looks you at, right in the eye and starts to laugh? <laughs> How many ever been there? What are you going to say? If God be for us, who can be against us? See, I want to drill this into our spirits. What if the teacher says, you know what? You're never going to amount to anything. You think that's unusual? That kind of dismissive attitude happens all the time in our world. People will tell you you're never going to pull it off. People will tell you you're going to fail at business. People are going to tell you that you just can't make it because you'll trip up because you're just like your daddy or your mommy or your uncle Ned. Somebody's always going to rain on your parade. And when they do that, you need to say, if God be for us, who can be against us? Am I right? Sometimes the devil himself will come and say, you're guilty. He'll try to condemn you. He will. There's two things you need to tell him. Number one, remind him there's only one judge. And the other thing you need to do is quote to him, 831 Romans, right? If God be for us, who can be against us? See, God's for you. He really is. No, you can't go along in your life completely indifferent to his call and to his commandments and to his love. You can't go along and just kind of ignore God. But listen, my message tonight is this, and it's central to the gospel. It's central in the Bible. God is for you. God is for me. He wants to bless his children. He loves to deliver his people. If you call on the name of the Lord, just call on his name, you will be saved. Oh, man. This ought to motivate somebody to get jazzed and to get excited. But listen to this. God not only flips the odds in our favor because if he's for us, who can be against us? But I love this part. He goes a step further. Not only does he flip the odds in your favor, but he also makes us partners. Matter of fact, Pastor Sean, in his little discussion, not knowing what I was going to preach, quoted the verse. This is the verse I want you to focus on. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. First part of the verse, and it says this. For we are laborers together with God. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. And I like the King James where it says, we are laborers together with God. We are laborers together with Him. You say, well, Randy... 
Talk to me a little bit about that. Thank you. I'm glad you suggested I do that. Think about Adam and Eve. God prepares this amazing place for them to live called the Garden of Eden. He prepares everything they need. There's all kinds of fruits. There's everything they need to survive. Not only survive, but to thrive. To do well. All the way back at the very beginning of creation. And we see this principle at work. We are laborers together with God. We are fellow workers with God. So when Adam and Eve are placed in the garden, the question is, did they just kind of lounge around? Did they make believe they were in, you know, the Bahamas at Treasure Island, enjoying life and having a long vacation, just sitting by the beach and having people bring iced tea to them? No. What did God put them in there and tell them to do? Work the garden. Work the garden. You see, before the fall, before man ever sinned, God expected him to work and to labor. The Hebrew word is labor. It's mentioned 290 times in the Old Testament. And it means to sweat. It means to work, but not in a fruitless way, not in a way it, 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 that's wrong, but it just means that God's going to give you a job to do. So they were called to labor and tend the garden. So God also gave them responsibilities beyond that. You see, here's what I want you to notice. God did so much for them, but he wanted them to be a part of the equation. He wanted them to produce. He wanted them to do the things that he called them to do. He wanted them to be included and involved in his vision and his work and his intentions for the human race. That's what, his, that's what he wanted them to do. So he gave them responsibility. Some people think Adam and Eve were just these dumb people. But I don't think they were dumb at all. They probably were quite intelligent, created as perfect specimens of the human mind. And God said, not only do I want to put you in here, and I want you to work the garden, but I also want you to name the animals. Name the animal, all the different creatures. And that's what Adam and Eve, they named the animals. People say, well, how hard is it to, to tend a garden? Well, please keep in mind, no one had ever done it before. They had to learn and absorb and grasp what had to happen. They were working to do what God had called them to do. And what they were really doing, can I offer this as an analogy? They were responsible for their own environment. Uh, let me say that again. They were responsible for their own environment. See, we build our own situation many times. Many times what we do is what we're surrounded by. We have a responsibility with our surroundings. We have a responsibility with our relationships. We have a responsibility with our spouse and our children. We have a responsibility for how our environment comes together and how pleasing it is or how obnoxious it may be. A lot of times it's just us and what we're doing. And you know what? In the garden, Adam and Eve were a perfect picture of that. God didn't come in there and take care of how they wanted the bushes shaped and where they wanted the pruning done. God didn't come in and take care of where to plant the new seeds or how to cultivate it. God didn't come in and do everything for them. Because God wants us to have our own environment, our own world, and the glory of God shining through us by virtue of what we're doing. Is this making sense to everybody? And so I love that picture. Adam and Eve shaping the bushes, getting the fruit, doing the things they were called to do. And it was very easy and wonderful because sin hadn't entered in. But it was in that very environment that something crept in. And we know the serpent came. It was Satan in the form of a serpent. And he came in and tempted Eve, ultimately tempting Adam. And he brought them down because they yielded to a voice other than God's. And all of a sudden, everything became a lot more messy and a lot harder. So you say, Randy, what does that mean for me? That means you are responsible for your environment. And if you want your environment to be elevated, lifted, you want the things in your life to get better instead of worse, you need to listen to the voice of God. You need to walk in the cool of the day with the Lord. You need to hear what he has to say. And I think sometimes in the evening when he walked with them, when God had fellowship with them, he was instructing them. He was giving them ideas on how to take care of the garden, what to do, how to invest in their own lives. I believe that because Jesus came and taught us. And he is the very image of God. And so we see Adam and Eve growing, but then they tripped. My point is, 
God looked to them to labor with him. That's my point. And God's still looking for the same thing in your life. He's still looking for every one of us to come alongside his vision, hear his word, respond to the things he calls us to do. People say, well, you know what? I'm not smart enough. I'm not influential enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not rich enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not anything enough to match up with God. How could I work with God? I'm just a little human being. But from the beginning, from the beginning, that was his vision. That we would join in. That we would partake. That we would be in this realm, kings and priests. Isn't that what the Bible says to believers? Wielding authority, doing what God called us to do, trimming the bushes, bringing in the harvest, bringing in the fruit, planting the seed, overseeing what God intends to happen. All of us got to stand up in our own homes and take responsibility for that environment in that home. And don't let Satan come slithering in and pushing back in the name of Jesus. Don't say, well, I don't have enough influence. I don't have enough brains. I don't have enough money. I don't have a degree. There's always these excuses. But God didn't say he wanted to labor you, you to labor for him he said he wanted you to labor with him Jesus said you know you've been my servants but from now on you're my friends can you see that shift but we labor with him so people say how can I labor with God how can I partner because really what it is can you see that it's a partnership can you see that we have a viable responsibility in the partnership. It's almost impossible to imagine we could labor with God. He's so much bigger than we are. He's so much more powerful than we are. But he invests his spirit and he invests his presence into our very lives. So we can be an extension, his hand extended. We can be his feet going out to preach the gospel. We can be the word of the Lord for people who need encouragement. Is this landing with you guys? Oh, yes. God is looking for us to labor with him. And Jesus confirmed this principle. Jesus confirmed this principle in his teaching in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. This is from the New Living Translation. It says this, then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Listen, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. You see, but I want you to notice that the yoke is a part of it. Is this making sense? The yoke, we, we've got to get harnessed up with God. We've got to come alongside Jesus and say, Lord, I want to do your will. I want to be participating in this. I want to be productive. I want to be fruitful in my life. This is so important. Because our focus ought to be to glorify God in everything we do. And so what's a yoke? A yoke is something you put on an animal or two. So that you can do work. So you can labor. So that you can see the fruit of your efforts. So that you can see the beauty of something multiplying. When you plant a seed, it just multiplies. Oh, what a wonderful thing that is. And so Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Why is it so easy? Why is it easy to take his yoke upon us? He says it's easy. He said, my burden's light. Why? Because he's carrying most of the weight. But he wants you to participate. He values you that much that at the end of the day, he's going to say to some of us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because we were willing to take a step up into maturity. We were willing to do what God called us to do. We didn't turn a blind eye or a deaf ear to it, but we said, yes, Lord, show me what I need to be doing and I'll be doing it. And I've said many times, being in ministry, I've learned this principle really well. And it's a wonderful thing. It's refreshing to do the work of the Lord, but it's not always easy. I had a minister friend of mine who was somebody I respected very much told me this one time. He said, you know what? Ministry is 90% work. And you know what? He was wrong. Because I have found that ministry is probably more like 95% work. 
It takes a lot of effort to minister somebody. The grace of God is what propels you. The grace of God is what animates you. But it takes some effort. It takes some going beyond what's, what's normal. I mean, if it didn't take any effort, why did Jesus rebuke them when he asked them to pray for one hour? And after about 10 minutes, they were snoring. It takes diligence. It takes uh, being alert. It takes working at the things God's called us to do. Why did Jesus say, pray the Father of the harvest, that he will send laborers into the field, for they are white and ready to be brought in. Why did he say that? Because there's something about laboring with God. Aren't you glad, though, that it's productivity? Hallelujah. Come on, how many, come, how many can say that? And when, when Adam and Eve messed up, one of the penalties was, you're going to have to bring fruit out of the ground, but now you're going to do it from the sweat of your brow. And because of that, because of sin, sometimes the work is hard. Sometimes it's weir wearying and frustrating, and sometimes you don't feel like you're getting anywhere. Do you ever get that way? Has that ever happened to you? Keep praying for so-and-so. You keep praying for your nephew or your child, or you keep trying to reach out to people, and they seem to not really appreciate it. You know, and it becomes work. Come on, let's be honest. We always like to think of it as some kind of a, 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 a kind of a, a inspirational moment, but sometimes it's just work. So how do you labor with God? Well, how can I partner with God? I'm imperfect. I'm flawed in so many ways. I'm a sinner, yes, saved by grace, but I still recognize my weakness. But may I remind you, God uses imperfect, flawed people all the time. I mean, read the Bible. I mean, read the Bible. It's incredible. So don't use that as an excuse. God's calling every one of us. I got my flaws. I got my weaknesses. You got yours. Can I get an amen from somebody? But yet God says, I will use you. I want you to labor with me. We're in this thing together. You say, Randy, what about these imperfect, flawed people? Give me some proof that God uses them. Could I mention the 12 original disciples? Have you noticed they had some flaws? Is anybody out there tonight? You know, several times they argued about who would be greatest. Do you remember the mother of uh, the sons of Zebedee? That would have been John and James. Do you remember she came to him and said, Jesus, I want one of my sons on your right hand and the other one on, my, on the left hand. She was so interested. And he, they would have a position in the kingdom, not knowing exactly where everything was headed. But they were flawed people. There were many instances of them arguing. Look it up in a concordance, you'll find it. How about Thomas? One of the original apostles. And he was a doubter. He was honest. I'm going to give him a mark for that. That's good. But he was a doubter. His faith wasn't strong. He was a believer in a lot of ways. Peter contradicted Jesus and messed up regularly. I love the part where he cuts the guy's ear off. How many love that part of the Bible? You know, I mean, he was just constantly putting mouth, foot in mouth. You know what I'm saying? And yet these flawed people, the Bible says, turned the world upside down. Think about it. These flawed people changed the course of history. These flawed people went out and healed the sick and cast out devils. These flawed people brought liberty and freedom to people in their spirits and their souls. So let's not use that as an excuse. And think about when God established the covenants. We have two covenants in the Bible, the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New Testament or the New Covenant. The Old Testament, we have the law and the prophets, the Psalms, the Proverbs, some other poetic books. Beautiful, beautiful. I love reading the Old Testament. And then we have the New Testament, which has all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you know, the book of Acts, all the epistles, which are letters, and then the Revelation and all these other things in there. There's a lot of wonderful things for us to grasp. But when he established the covenant, when God established the covenant, who did he use? You're not going to be able to opt out. God's going to use you. Because when he established the first covenant, who does he choose? Sarah and Abraham. And Sarah's 90 years old when she finally gets pregnant. And Abraham's 100. Talk about miracles. Come on, is anybody here tonight? You know, that's a, that's a serious miracle. God, God could have got somebody a little younger, maybe in her 40s, you know, 50s. I mean, 
But, but God uses us. He used, sometimes I'm convinced God uses people uh, for, because, because they have weakness or because they're not totally capable. He somehow says, I'm going to glorify my name through you, even though, you know what, you don't got it all together yet. So God wants to use you. And listen, what about the new covenant? When he brought Sarah, her child, it was Isaac who ultimately led to the birth of the Messiah in the lineage. And that was an unlikely thing. Ninety years old, finally after years of delay, finally pregnant, brings forth a child. Like I said, Abraham, a hundred years old. That led ultimately to the coming of Jesus Christ in his first advent when he was born in Bethlehem. But how did God bring the new covenant? It was like the other extreme. He picks an unwed teenager. Now, who would have thought he would do that? She was, she was um, in covenant to be married. She was betrothed under the Jewish fashion. So in a sense married, but not consummated. There was no consummation. There was not a final life. She was still a teenager, and she hears from the angel, I'm going to use you. She probably went, who, me? You say, well, what are these teenagers going to do? I think they're going to shake the world up. What are these teenagers going to do? I think they're going to turn it upside down. What are these teenagers going to do? I think they're going to pray some people into the kingdom. They're going to be a light. They're going to shine their light. Mary was a teenager, and God brought the covenant through, the, through her. You talk about unlikely. So whatever excuses you've got, you know what I'm trying to get at? To not really be used by God or to feel inadequate or maybe like you don't match up or you can't step up or whatever it is. Whatever they are, forget about them. Because if God can use the disciples, if God can use Sarah and Abraham, if God can use Mary, an unwed teenager with no experience in life at all, he can use you. You can't say, well, I'm too young. Don't even start. Or I'm too old. Don't even start. Until you give birth at 100, 90 years old and your husband's 100, don't even talk. Just get ready to do what God's called you to do. <laughs> I see some people out there cringing to thought, you know, 90 years old. Push, push. No, I don't even want to think about that, right? And some people, listen, some people didn't even want the job. There are people who say they're believers there are people who say they're Christians, but they just don't even want the job if they're really honest. I can think of people in the Bible who were connected to the covenant. People, that, Moses is the first one that came to my mind. God ap appears to Moses in the burning bush, says, I need you to go down and do something for me. We're going to labor together on this, Moses. You go down, you be my mouthpiece. You go down, you declare the presence of God, the word of the Lord, what I'm going to do in the earth. You go down and you speak it, and I'll make it come to pass. I'll send in the flies. I'll send in the, uh, the turn the water to blood. I'll do all the rest. You just got to do your part of this because I want to labor with you. What does Moses say right away? I can't speak. I can't talk. I'm a stutterer. I'm going to go in and instead of, instead of boldly and authoritatively saying, let my people go. I'm going to go, let, 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 let. An hour later, he's finally going to get the message through to Pharaoh. Randy, are you mocking people? No, I'm not mocking people. I'm saying every one of us has got something wrong in our life. Every one of us has flaws and weaknesses. Every one of us doesn't do everything perfect, but yet God has told me, and I think he's already told you, he's going to use you. That's his intention. So get ready. Well, I'm just a plumber. He'll use you. I'm just an electrician. He'll use you. Could have used an electrician this week. The lights went out in the bathroom in the front, but we got it fixed. You say, well, I'm just, I'm just taking care of my kids. I'm a homekeeper. God will use you. Don't you worry about that. I'm a teenager. I'm so young. I don't know much. I don't even know much about the Bible. That's all right. Keep reading. The Holy Spirit's going to remind you what you need to know. He's going to use you. The only people he can't use are the ones who refuse to step up and say, I'm going to be a part of this. That's the only one he can't use. The one that doesn't believe is not committed to his vision, doesn't care what he says. But Moses, he wanted out. He didn't want the job. Next one I thought of, I wrote it down, Jonah. God wanted to use Jonah. He was a prophet. He was plugged into the thing. 
He was having revival meetings. He was meeting with the bishops and meeting with the, you know, he was plugged into the system. And yet when God told him to go to Nineveh, he went the opposite direction. He didn't want the job. But guess what? That usually doesn't work out too well. Unless you like to spend some quality time with a large fish. You might want to just go ahead and do what God asked you to do. <laughs> it's a lot mess, uh, cleaner. It's not quite so messy. You don't smell like tuna for the next three weeks. I, I, I don't know if anybody's hearing me tonight. But I'm setting you up. How many know I'm setting you up? Because God wants every one of you plugged into his plan and what he wants to do. He's got people in your life he wants to reach. He's got people in your life he wants to encourage. He's, and he doesn't just come swooping in and do it. He does sometimes. Sometimes God will insinuate himself right into the middle of something. But you know what? He says, I'm going to use you guys for ambassadors. We're going to labor together. Yay. That's what God's looking for. God's looking for that kind of a heart. Not just opting out. No, I got my own agenda. No, I got to go here. I got to go there. I got to do this. I got to do that. No, no. That's, that's, that, yeah, listen. Listen, you want quality in your life. You want meaning in your life. You want something that raises the, 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 it, the, that evens the odds, let's put it that way. Then plug in with God. Labor with Him. And all of a sudden, the odds are going to turn in your favor. And the ultimate one, and I wanted to finish with this, is Gideon. Now, before I mention Gideon, I did, I did want to remember to say the, this name, because this name was one who didn't really want the job. Paul, formerly known as Saul, because he was going around persecuting the church, driving everybody crazy, throwing people in jail, overseeing the martyrdom of Stephen and others who were believers. And God wanted to use him, but he didn't want to be used for what God wanted him to be used for. So God knocked him down with a bright light, spoke to him in an audible voice. How many believe that would get your attention? So let's just avoid that part. Let's just cooperate with God right now without going through all that. How many are with me? Come on. Let's do what God's calling us to do. So what is that? We love people. Love the enemy even. What is that? Share the gospel. Let people know Jesus is Lord. What is that? That means to reach out to young people and give them an encouraging word. That means to take of your finance and your blessings, whatever you have, and share it with others. And certainly to support the things of God. All those things what mean that you're, you're laboring with God. But Gideon was the guy that really was amazing because he was so honest. Gideon, you remember him? They, 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 you had Israel and the Midianites. Israel being the chosen people of God. The Midianites being idol worshipers, troublemakers, all around bad guys. And the Midianites, the Bible says in Judges, the sixth chapter, kept overrunning the crops and the livestock of the Israelites so that they were really paupers. They, they came in and took what they had, trampled it underfoot, like they came with the hordes of people, and they dominated the Jewish people. The is, Israel was being impoverished, and, and they were in bad straits. And so in Judges 6.6, 6, it says this, so Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel, what? Cried out to the Lord. That's a good idea. When all else fails, cry out to God. And so an angel comes, and you read the Scripture. Read the, read the uh, two chapters, 6 and 7 of Judges. It's interesting to read the whole thing. And the angel sits under a tree and watches Gideon. What's Gideon doing? Well, Gideon's this young guy, and he's back hiding behind the barn, so to speak, threshing wheat. But notice the word I used. He's hiding because they were afraid of the Midianites. They were afraid of these people who were oppressing them. He was afraid to show himself and let anybody see that wheat because he thought they would come in and not only kill him, but take what he had. So he hid. Finally, after the angel sits there for a while, and most theologians believe it was the Lord, and even in the Scripture it says, and then the Lord turned to him. Angel meaning a messenger, Right? the Lord himself, and the angel walks over to him while he's hiding and says these fateful words, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not a picture of bravery in my book. Scared to death, knees knocking together, trying to get a little wheat 
pulled together so you can make a bread, some bread for your family. I mean, scared, hiding from them. He's hiding. But remember, God's view of you is not based on your weaknesses, but on your potential through him. See, you're, when God looks at you, he's not basing it on the things that he sees in you that are flaws. He looks at you with his wonderful eye, his divine sight, and he sees what you could do. So you're looking at your flaws. God's looking at what you could pull off if you just labored with him, if you just cooperated on any level. You could be a loser. Come on, how many for a long time if you want to be? That's fine. God will give you that room. But you could also labor with him and become a, become a king and a priest more than a conqueror. You could be fulfilled in aspects of your life you never dreamed of and have a spiritual sense of the eternal that will turn your life around. And so the angel says this to him. And what does Gideon say? And he's honest. He says, well, why, if, if, if God's God and if God's with us, why has this all happened to us? Why is this happening? I know nobody's ever asked that question in here. You never got in a circumstance ever, I'm sure, where you said, why is this happening to us? And he went a little further. He said, where are all the miracles they talked about? See, he's just being honest. You know what? I say that sometimes. I say, where are all the miracles? You know, but I'll tell you what. I could start enumerating miracles that have happened in this church over the last few years, and you'd be amazed at the miracles that God has done in people's lives. So the miracles are happening. But they were going through a dry spell, and, and Gideon was honest. He said, why is this happening to us? Where are all the miracles? Look at Judges 6.15. So he, Gideon, said to him, the Lord, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? How can I labor with God? How can I be a part of this equation? How can I do something substantive for the Lord? I mean, for heaven's sake, I'm just little puny me. He says, indeed, my clan is the weakest. Anybody here ever feel like you were the weakest one? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. I, I, I've often wondered, where did he get where did he get that view of himself? Where did he get that view of his family? Where did he get that kind of a disappointing, kind of depressing look at what he thought could happen in his life? Why did that happen? And you know what? I found out a lot of people are that way because of circumstances, situation, things they've been through, things people have said to them. And they've gotten to the point where they're down on themselves. What he was roughly saying, if I can just be really honest about it, he said he was basically saying the, the odds are we're toast. I mean, if you're relying on me, in my weakling family, in my, I'm the least of all of them. But that's the kind of person God likes to use. That's the, and, and, and you know what happened? You read the rest of the story. I won't get into the details because i got to finish. But the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Gideon. The Spirit of the Lord. And Gideon grabs a shofar and he starts playing when the saints go marching in. He starts blowing on that shofar, and he calls the people from everywhere around. And then I want you to look at Judges 7, 2. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Wait a minute, let me get this straight, Lord. So you're saying we've got 32 or 3,000, I think 32,000 people here. And you're telling me that's too many. Because I thought lots was a good thing. I thought having lots of soldiers, lots of arms, lots of people to fight the battle, I thought, in my thinking, that's a good thing. No, God said, no, no, no. He said, you've got too many here. Why? Because he says, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, I'm just going to give you a little spiritual dynamic right here. Sometime God will allow you to be outnumbered. Sometimes God will allow the odds to be stacked against you. You know, you feel like, how am I going to get out of this? You know what? That's when we learn to turn our faith to him. And then when he sweeps in, when he starts to do something, 
Hallelujah. So God told him to do this. You got too many people, he said. So I want you to get in front of the people and tell them, if you're fearful and you're afraid, I want you to leave now. And 22,000 left. 22,000, two-thirds, over two-thirds just walked away. Again, at least they were honest. Come on, somebody say amen, right? That left 10,000. He said, it was still too many. So he said, I want you to take them down by the water. I want you to allow them to drink. And he says, those that lap the water like a dog, set them aside on one side. That was 300 out of 10,000. And he said, excuse and send home those who kneel down to drink. So he watched carefully, and he set them aside. And he ended up with the 300 on one side and the the 9,700 on the other side. And he sent the larger group home. And here he is facing a massive army. These people who had been overrunning the nation, everybody was taking advantage of them from every corner. And here he is facing them down with 300 people. How many say the odds were stacked against them? But that's when God gets the greatest victories. (laughs) <laughs> I love that, man. When I've been down and out and I didn't know what in the world was going to happen, all of a sudden, kaboom, God makes it happen. The odds are stacked against them. God brings victory, his greatest victories, in a situation just like that. I remember I was in Pennsylvania one time ministering in a church. And I was at the end of the service, and the Lord was giving me some insights as I was praying for some of the people that were there at the altar that came to the front. I want to finish with this, but I want to share this with you. And I, I saw this couple were standing down in front of me, and a word of knowledge came to me. One of the gifts of the Spirit, a word of knowledge. God still uses those things, absolutely. And so <clears throat> I, 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 I didn't know these people. I had no idea who they were. But the Lord said they're going to have a child. They're going to have a child. They're going to get pregnant, and she's going to give birth to a child. I'm thinking, man, I don't like to meddle in personal stuff too much, Lord. And the Lord just impressed on me that I was to share that word with those people. So, you know, how many know what I'm talking about? I I launched out. And, you know, she started to cry, and the husband grabbed a hold of her, and he started tearing up. And they were standing right in front of me, and I walked down, and I started to talk to them with the microphone so folks could participate and pray. And it turns out they've been trying to have a child for many, many years. It had been, I want to say, 10 or 12 years unsuccessfully. And here I am standing up there, not by my own strength. How many know I'm a weakling? Come on, let's just get a good amen on that one, right? But I, I'm just, but God showed me a, a, a spiritual insight. He gave it to me in a moment and said, I want you to be faithful. You're laboring with me. The odds are stacked against these people. 12 years, no hope from the doctors that they could ever have their own child. So what she said, what she said to me, she said, well, Randy, we just arranged for the adoption of a baby because we finally just gave up. And the Holy Spirit said to me, that's not what I'm talking about. I said, what, Lord? No, I'm not talking about the adoption. That's a bonus. Well, it was about 10 or 11 months later, I got a letter in the mail from that lady. And she Became pregnant, carried the baby to term, and in the last couple of weeks prior, she had given birth to a beautiful baby girl. So they had the adopted child. They got a double blessing and their own biological child. They had two wonderful children, and that was the odds were stacked against them. The doctors had given up, but never give up on God. I said, never give up on God. I don't care what the doctor, the lawyer, the banker, the educator, I don't care what they say. I don't even care what some aimless preacher says. God is able to do the impossible. Let's have faith in God. Let's not write him off for another era. Oh, no. God is alive. He is not dead. God moves among his people. God does the supernatural things of old. God can still move the mountain. God can do the miracle. God can turn the the tide in your life but let's labor with him. Let's be quick to hear his voice, quick to obey what he says. Can I get somebody to say, that's a good idea, Pastor. I agree with you. Let's all stand up, please.